days, including uh, Matt Brown Extra Point joins us. So, Matt, if the settlement was a settlement and everything, although the fine details aren't done, and now we get the impression that maybe there's a little more work to do than we thought. Is that what you're hearing too? <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's exactly it. You know, it's funny there was, there was a gigantic athletic industry conference in Vegas, uh, you know, a week or so ago, and, and Charlie Baker speaks and he says, you know, this is one of the the great things here about this particular settlement. Is this going to be the the tie that really binds all of Division One and really all of college athletics together here for the next decade? And here are the the high level talking points about the whole thing. And then everybody would file out of that gigantic room and they'd go into their other conference rooms for their little subgroups. And they would be talking about how that isn't, that isn't completely true. Um, the, everybody has had, has been briefed and had conference meetings and presidential meetings about some of what the high level changes financially will mean for their schools and their leagues, but there's still an enormous amount of, uh, of questions about how that money is distributed when it's distributed, and, and what the other rules are that still need to be determined. Matt, uh, with the opportunity that, that the, the P4 conferences are going to have to make way more money than everybody else and, and kind of set the direction of college athletics uh, as opposed to all the other conferences, um, do you think they need to maybe be, be more transparent about their intentions going forward as opposed to pretending that they care about everybody else right now? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny question, right? And it, it's, I, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of frame it like this. I don't think that every P4 commissioner or P4 athletic director or president is necessarily on the, the team we need to we need to leave the NCAA. You know, screw Sacred Heart, screw Incarnate Word. Let's let's go do our other thing. Some of that is because you, you still have some idealists who are working uh, at, at, at you know at, at, at the schools or in conferences, and you also have you know more Machiavellian leaders that understand we need to keep these guys around if for no other reason that they can that they can be a legal shield. Yeah, they can take some of the liability burden off of us the next time that we get sued and there is going to be a next time like this is this even if this house settlement goes through perfectly it's not going to be the last lawsuit that call a big time college sports faces so i actually think we're we're, we're approaching a, a really interesting time in college athletics because you have pressure at the top end where you have some leagues and and potentially some television networks or investment capital uh, you know groups that want to carve off the top the top performers, whether that's the P4 or some subset they're in. But increasingly, and I talked about this a little bit in my newsletter today, there's a, an increasing conversation at the bottom end where you are having more ADs and more presidents and more conferences ask themselves, is this still worth it? It's probably still worth it now, but at some point it's not worth paying for Texas and Oklahoma's legal fees and hope that we get a, you know, we win a 15 seed basketball game once every 10 years mm -hmm. uh, and, and figuring out exactly where that red line is, is a, uh, is a real conversation that's happening. Matt, I, I think I've said that a couple of times on this show in the past. I've just at what point, and I was talking more in relation to, you know, the big split, the idea there was the SEC and the big 10 are going to run off. And maybe that happens, you know, in five, 10 years, but, Clearly, that's not the split that's basically happening right now. But, yeah, at what point – and I was using more of, like, your your Baylors, your TCUs. But in, in this case, um, even in smaller schools, like, at what point do you say, okay, we're not going to live in that neighborhood. We don't have the money to afford it on a monthly basis. We've got yeah. other things we've got to take care of. Like, we just can't keep up with the Joneses. It's just – it's as simple as that, and you just have to acknowledge that at some point. It, yeah, and it, it's, it's kind of a little frustrating for me, I think, from my vantage, because if you get some of these leaders – at the hotel bar and you, you make it clear that your phone's turned off and you're just talking, you'll have, you'll have ADs and presidents tell you that's true now, right? Like yeah. the, the incarnate, again, I keep, I keep going back to this example, but like if you're in the Southland, you're not competing with Texas. You might beat them in baseball occasionally, you know, for a, a midweek series, but you're not really going after them for the same athletes. You're not meaningfully competing against them or Oklahoma or, or even most of the big 12, in most events, and that's okay. What you're hoping for, right, is to be able to have a, sh a uh, championship access that is meaningful and can provide a, a meaningful postseason opportunity 
uh, and a chance to compete, you know, on, on, on some level, uh, an, uh, an individual you know, competition with those guys. But you're not trying, no one's sitting there thinking like, man, we have to go figure out how we're going to share $21 million in revenue so we can compete with the SEC. Like these guys don't make $21 million. So they understand, but it's political suicide to get up there and, and say to the local newspaper or say on the record to somebody like me, Hey, maybe we should think about being a different classification or maybe we need to make that split formalized because your coaches will freak out. You'll get beaten up in recruiting. Your regents will freak out. Your donors will freak out. And there's so much political pressure to maintain this facade, even though a lot of people at this point understand it's, it, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, looking at the math, and I, you know, I talked to a couple of conference commissioners over the, the, the past week and a half or so, and a, a few more ADs, about what exactly this settlement means to the other 22-ish conferences. I don't think these numbers alone are going to drive anybody out of the NCAA. Um, there's some lawsuits and, and some really difficult questions about, you know, philosophy and, and what this means for the next lawsuit. But I don't, I don't think we're that far away from somebody then being able to sit down there and just getting in and getting out the Excel spreadsheet and recognizing pretty soon this math doesn't math anymore as awesome as the NCAA tournament is. Well, we had Tarleton Todd Whitten on just a moment ago. Yeah. And, you know, they have that, that transition period. They were pretty good last year, but still denied a bowl game or a playoff spot. And I asked him, I said, do you, is it a, in your thought that you guys are going to take this time to make this transition? They're pretty good. And then by the time you get there, it's going to change again. And he absolutely said, oh, I think about it every day, every yeah, single you day. Have to. Yeah. So uh, yeah. can you put Houston Christian University in the dynasty mode when the game comes out? <laughs> because it's so funny. I-, I love it that they have the balls to be able to say, wait a minute, we need to try to see what we can do here, whether they get squashed or not. You know, it, it, it's so funny. I, I have spoken to literally two other ADs in the past 36 hours that specifically said, I wish – we had, in so many words, I wish, I wish we had. I wish we had balls like they did. I wish we had the political power or or the um, the, the the backing from our presidents, from our regents, from our community to go out there and, and go out on a limb like this because they're right. Um, and college sports is a copycat industry, and, and a lot of a lot of schools will will, will you know believe one thing, but they feel like they, they, they don't have the, the permission or the ability to kind of step out on that ledge. But once they say, once they see three or other four other schools making that decision, then they'll then they'll get up there and join them. You know, Houston Christian is in a position where I, I think you know, I I, don't, I mean no disrespect to them, right? They they, they know what they're competing for. Right. <laughs> they're not trying to maximize television revenue. They they know that they're not on the short list to get into the American Athletic Conference. Their institutional mission is different, and so they can afford to piss some people off. Uh, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if in the you know the next week. You hear some other schools file, you know, friend of the court briefs or, or try to, to publicly support this action uh, in some way. Now, is it is, is it going to be successful? Probably not. Uh, if, if a bunch of other schools get together, maybe, you know, this is the kind of thing that, that the judge Claudia Wilkins going to certainly going to certainly look at. And that's this is an example of those difficult conversations that I think everyone needs to have here. And I don't think there's necessarily a right or a wrong answer. You just need to be able to identify as a school and say, you know, what, once our legal exposure or our costs become X, that's when we have to hit the ejection button. I, I know one of the things that I think maybe more schools like like HCU should be doing is getting together as a group of all 150, 200 of them and hire a consulting company to help them figure out, hey, just hypothetically, what would, our, what would the basketball tournament rights be like if we had a tournament that didn't have the P4 and the Big East? Um, it's obviously not going to be what, what CBS is paying for March Madness, but if you had a 32 team tournament with, with 20 other conferences, theoretically, what kind of money are you looking at? Because you, now you, you also don't have to divide that up with as many ways. Maybe the financial difference isn't that big. I, who knows? It's worth, it's worth asking. Matt, it scares me that you would say that because, uh, you know, I don't want that to change. The, the one thing, like, of all the things they've done to shake things up, the fact that they're trying to get more teams in the tournament, which doesn't mean – more Creightons. Well, I guess they're in the bees, but like it doesn't mean yeah. more more of the of the Cinderella type teams. It means more P four teams. It more, more to the Big Twelve yeah. and SEC and and all of that. Um, like, where is the tipping point where where 
college athletics gets too corporate and too big where it doesn't feel at all like it used to? Or are we past that now? I, I, well, I think it kind of depends on who you ask, right? Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 37, and the, I, I have no emotional memory of college sports before, you know, Board of Regents, before widespread cable television access. Uh, tickets were always pretty expensive, where, where I lived and, and, and naming rights and all of those things were, I've, I've always been part of my world. If I was maybe 20 years older, I might, I might feel differently. Um, but it's, it's been a big business for as long as I've been alive, certainly as long as I've been a working journalist. Uh, I wouldn't blame somebody in their sixties for saying already, Hey, this, this is not what I signed up for. This isn't what I like. I, not all of the changes happening now necessarily have to be negative, but they will be different. Um, I, you know, it's hard, it's hard for me to be super optimistic about some of the, the consolidation uh, and real hardball happening out of the Big Ten and the SEC. But many of these changes are going to lead to, I think, you know, better financial outcomes for athletes. They could lead to better experiences for many of those athletes. And if, if some people can be persuaded to maybe not try to kill the golden golden goose, I could see a world in two or three years where we actually have a much better college baseball tournament or a much better college hockey tournament or, 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 or better changes elsewhere. There's just a lot of risk because as a sport and certainly as an, and as an industry, college sports does not do a very good job of looking out for any long-term interest um, or any cohesive interest. It's very every man for himself, short-term thinking, which leads to, you know, difficult policies. Matt, do some of these ADs have uh, self-awareness? And, and I ask that because I, I saw Dan Wetzel commenting on, like, in the midst of all these issues, the, the other day they're meeting in Naples, Florida, at the Ritz-Carlton, and it's like yeah. you're, but you're, you're complaining about money and, and, you know, all this, and yet millions are rolling in, and you guys are all meeting at the fanciest, you know, place imaginable. Um, is there a self-awareness there, or is it they just <laughs> don't care, quite frankly? I, I, th- I think it's both. Like, I talked to a lot of people about this, again, at, at, at NACTA, which is you know, the, the, the big industry event. That's it. That's a, that's a Mandalay Bay in, in Las in Vegas. And, and, and they do that because there's 5,000 people at this event and there's not that many places that have all, you know, that kind of hotel space and convention center space and availability all in one spot. But I, I just think they remember the, the big part of Charlie Baker's address to all of college athletics film, right. And is about the evils of prop betting and how he wished that, that we could put the genie back in the bottle a little bit for, for sports betting and gambling and, and was really passionate about, about some of the, the negative impact that it has on athletes. And I'm sitting there thinking, even if I agree with every single thing you're saying, you're literally giving this speech from a casino. Yeah. Like every little, <laughs> every single thing that anybody has said, the Knight Commission this and, and university presidents that and all these academics about this very high-minded uh, you know, vision for college athletics – that's all well and good, but I had to I had to walk through a strip tease to get here, you know, from from my hotel. The, the last uh, five hundred yards leading to everything you're saying it runs against everything that you're saying, and it, it's, it's a similar thing here with 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 the, with the conference meetings in in Naples. I actually talked to a couple of uh, you know one AAA commissioners that are, were planning on skipping the event entirely, which they normally don't do out of frustration for like, look, we're all just, it's just whatever Greg Sankey wants anyway. So why am I going to show up? I'm going to stay on vacation. Right. Um, being able to, you know, not get in, stay out of, not step on their own toes and, and uh, to make peace with the terrible optics or, or try to mitigate those for some of these decisions. It's never really been a strong suit. Sometimes that's unavoidable, but if you want to paint a picture of everybody involved being a terrible hypocrite, even if that maybe isn't always the, the reality, it's it's really easy to do. And, and doing a big thing at the Ritz Carlton is exactly why, right? You yeah. could do this at the O'Hare Airport, you know, conference center. As, as look, as hotels in Naples go, Matt, I grew up in Fort Myers, just just close to yeah. there. The Ritz is like a Holiday Inn Express, though. So by oh. Naples' economic standards, yeah. it's cheap. Yeah, yeah. The, the, is the, what do they have? The, the Ritz Carlton's great, no matter yeah. what city it's in. Matt, when the settlement was announced, which we now know is not official, one of the yeah. things I thought from that was that, well, this will also secure that there won't be any other, other lawsuits. We had uh, Darren Heitner on yesterday, yeah. and in the article by Ross, and also, of course there's going to be more lawsuits. They're not, it's not going to stop anything. So was that another 
a, a feed, a line to, to the fish so they could grab it and just hold on? Uh, I, I mean, I, I personally agree with Aaron here. I, I think he's right. I think there will be more lawsuits. I think that if this settlement is approved, it will buy the NCAA a period of peace from one of their biggest antagonists and one of the places where they're most vulnerable, which is Jeff Kessler mm-hmm. and his and his law firm on antitrust grounds. That you can buy yourself 10 years of insurance from him and, and potentially other antitrust suits for a while. That's not nothing like that. That is a significant, uh, you know, you know, bit of safety here. But it absolutely is not free from all litigation. You still haven't dealt with the employment issue. They're still asking Congress for that. Uh, that could come from uh, multiple different angles where, where those lawsuits can continue. And in fact, I would expect them, uh, other people to file additional complaints after the settlement because it gets even harder to say we're not employees to paying people 21 million bucks. Uh, you have uh, suits that can be brought by state courts and, and state AGs, like what's happened with Tennessee and Virginia and and what, what happened elsewhere over transfer restrictions, I imagine that will continue as soon as the NCAA does something unpopular uh, to old state U for an AG that needs to win another statewide election. There's going to be other uh, concussions and, and health insurance potential litigation that, that, that's, that's coming here. So I, I get why they're saying it, and they're not completely wrong. But I think anybody with an NCAA email address – that's trying to, or anybody, or anybody else is trying to sell the settlement as a panacea to, uh, for for complete labor and litigation peace over the next ten years, is 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 not accurate. <laughs> that that sounds like somebody who has a vested financial interest in the outcome here. Uh, Matt, um, EA Sports released their top uh, twenty five uh, schools. Uh, toughest <laughs> place to play. I know it's a part of the metric that makes it hard, uh, you know, harder in, in different spots. I gotta ask you. Uh, I'm fine with almost everybody in the list, but South Carolina at 15, like it's not been hard for anybody to beat South Carolina ever in the history of South Carolina. I I got to be honest, like and I've tried real hard to be diplomatic about EA and 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 try to to spend a lot of months, mm. you know, trying to help people understand that these are real human beings and that maybe we're complaining about stuff that that's that that's not that's not fair. The list isn't that good, right? Like I think, I think a lot of the concerns about the list are valid. Now, now for people that are, are really worried, it's not set in stone. When you play in Dynasty mode, the list is fluid. There's going to be regular updates. But I would agree with you. I look at that and think, yeah, South Carolina 15 is probably too high. Uh, I think Utah, or was it like 19 or 20, is way too low. Um, they've been just, uh, you know, dynamite at home over the last couple of years. And between the, and the elevation and the way that stadium is constructed where it gets loud and mean, uh, that is an extremely difficult place to play. I would probably put Penn State or LSU at number one. Uh, Kyle, you know, A&M at Kyle Field would, would not have been my choice, but, if, but I, I don't, I'm not going to make a federal case at it, whether they're at one or four or seven. Like, you know, that's, that, that, that's fine. But there are there are some smaller stadiums that that should have been on that list. And, you know, Bud Elliott at, at CBS was saying, you know, Wyoming should be there. And quite frankly, I think he's right. Some of these are just big rather than difficult. Like yeah. you know, I've, I've I've been to sold out games at Michigan Stadium. It's not that loud, and it's it's and it's it's not the wine and cheese crowd joke about Michigan so much as the architecture of the stadium where it's while you there's like a jillion people there, but the noise isn't captured. I think Oregon. Is half the size of Michigan. It's a way louder stadium. Yep, no question. Anything else, Greg? Uh, J.G. Neolardo for you, Matt, in the chat room. Matt Brown needs to be careful. He's making too much sense, and we know what happens to these people. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, listen, I've, ha- I've had a good run. <laughs> if, 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 if the black helicopters from Indianapolis come and get me, It'll, or or so if, if the EA Sports or the Learfield people come get me eventually, like, you know, listen, I, I went out doing what I loved, yeah. which is writing extremely nerdy stuff about college sports business. Like, it was, it was a good run. Yeah, it's great, too. Extra points. Matt Brown, you should get or subscribe for the newsletter. Uh, it is a bunch. It is a lot. We appreciate it, Matt. Have a great rest of your week. Of, of course. Thank no, you. it's always a pleasure. Take you care. You too. Matt Brown with us. Uh, just low. Loaded with information, calls people all the time. Love to have him on the show. Yeah, I need to get to Happy Valley.